Soviet Union, July 4, 1956. CIA pilot Harvey Stockman completed his first reconnaissance flight mission over enemy territory on board the Lockheed U-2 Article No. 347. Despite the mission being a success, as subsequent operations were executed, it became clear that eventually this intelligence gathering method would soon become vulnerable to interception. The answer? Stealth technology. Lockheed's president, Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, initiated a small project for an eventual successor of the U-2, a project that would give birth to one of the most iconic planes in history. A series of studies were performed to determine if an airplane invisible to radar was possible. After many tests, Lockheed researchers came out with mainly two conclusions. First, stealth was conceivable, and several configurations were tested with relative success. Second, enemy radar capabilities would get better over time. This indicated that this technology alone was not sufficient to ensure mission success. It didn't take long for them to realize that the best way to penetrate enemy territory, collect and successfully aggress with reconnaissance data, two other preconditions were necessary. Fly extremely high, exceptionally fast. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. In 1957, the CIA initiated Project Gusto. Its goal was to develop U-2's replacement. Enter General Dynamics Convair Division and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. General Dynamics' approach used two airplanes, the first being the B-58B and the second the first invisible super hustler, Fish. The idea was to have B-58B carry Fish up to launch altitude, but eventually General Dynamics failed to sell its B-58B prototype to the United States Air Force, imposing a major review to the project. Because Fish was initially meant to be carried by another airplane, they quickly had to change this concept, to which they nicknamed Kingfish. On Lockheed's side, many designs were studied, such as the Arrow 1, Archangel 1, and Archangel 2. On November 25, 1958, both companies received compensation to continue refining its prototype airplanes. For the next year, Lockheed would spend most of its time refining no less than 10 of its major designs, A3 to A12. One pattern is stood out from all models, and that was the design trend of the Delta Wing, as portrayed on A-10 model and later established on the finalized version A-12. The competition for the CIA secret airplane development came to an end on August 29, 1959, when Lockheed received an official notification for its winning design, the A-12. A $4.5 million advance award was given to continue development of the plane. Eventually, the Air Force saw a potential in developing an interceptor variant of A-12, becoming AF-12 under the project codename Cadlock. The project added some modifications to A-12, such as the second seat, in order to have a fire weapons control section. Tunnel wind tests showed that the new requirements made the plane unstable and required the nose section to be reconfigured. Other parts of the plane were also reconfigured, but most notably the new J-57 engines were installed. Later gained a new name, YF-12. At the same time, the SR-71 was being developed and its purpose was to become everything in one. Due to the high cost of all programs and being several years late for delivery, everything almost came to an end on February 5, 1968. It was NASA on the following year that saved the program in a joint effort with the United States Air Force. Their goal was to use the plane to study high-altitude flying at high speed. But we all know today what their real intentions were. It was then that the SR-71 became the king of the skies. 
In the beginning of the project, Lockheed flirted with stealth technology. Although the SR-71 is not stealth, it did contain some features that helped minimize its radar signature. Most notably are the chine features of the plane in a triangular sawtooth pattern. If it wasn't for this feature, the plane would most likely be cylindrical and rely mainly on speed and altitude as its main line of defense. This was clearly a first attempt to create what they now call radar absorbent structure, and it works something like this. As the radar signal hits the structure, it bounces from side to side, losing energy. You could say that the sawtooth absorbed the signal. For it to work properly, this pattern was allocated all around the plane. However, the heat signature of the plane was what mostly gave it away, being highly visible to any radar. To overcome this problem, a black matte paint was used to dissipate heat, and cesium was added to the fuel to minimize electrical conductivity. Even though these steps greatly minimized its RCS, once in a while, enemy radar was able to find it. Nevertheless, there wasn't much they could do. After all, its escape maneuver was just to increase its speed to Mach 3. Building a Mach 3 plane is no easy feat. Since the goal was to fly as high and as fast as possible, the structure of the plane would have to survive the most extreme of temperatures. To achieve that, they decided to use a metal that was never used before. Up to 93% of the plane was made out of titanium, while the rest were composite materials. At its purest form, its ultimate tensile strength can reach 434 megapascals. Today, titanium alloys can more than triple that number. In comparison to other metals, it is evident why titanium was chosen. What really mattered about this selection was the fact that titanium structure can work at much higher variance of temperatures. And in this case, since the SR-71 worked through extreme temperatures, a metal that could survive freezing cold all the way to more than six times the boiling temperature of water was a must. As a frame of reference, the heat signature of the plane at Mach 3.2 looked something like this. The nose of the aircraft reached 300 degrees Celsius, while the leading edge of the cockpit windshield was at 327. At the wings, you would find the most extreme of temperature variance. At the edge leading to the engine, the temperature was at 272 degrees Celsius, and immediately at the engine nacelles, it jumped to 308, reaching 565 at the center, and 648 degrees Celsius at the opening of the jet exhaust. It was crucial for the metal to not deform and to maintain its strength. This was clear evidence of the precision of engineering and manufacturing success. However, temperature added another problem. Since cooling any internal components of any plane is done using forced air from outside, when flying a Mach 3.2, it's just not possible. A lot of insulation was necessary to keep things working including the pilot and the reconnaissance system officer with their special suits. In order to make the plane work, every single part of it was designed with specific functions that complemented each other. The plane can be divided into 21 parts, 4 main sections, and 17 subsections. At the 4 main sections, we have the nose, forward fuselage, aft fuselage, and outer wing with outer nacelle half. At the nose section we have the pit dot mast. Inside the nose it contained a radar with an optional imaging system. Depending on the mission, the nose could be empty. On the forward fuselage we have the two cockpits for the pilot and the RSO. Immediately behind, the air conditioning bay right next to the aerial refueling door. It is in this section that all reconnaissance components are located and could carry a wide range of different cameras and sensors. This section could hold payloads as large as 40 by 43 by 233 centimeters and weight as much as 409 kilograms. 
almost at the very end, is where the technical objective cameras were installed and used for the most part of the early 1980s. They had enough film to cover 2,644 kilometers at 80,000 feet, with a precision of 10 to 12 centimeters resolution under ideal conditions. Then we have the fuel tanks divided into three sections. Tank 1A, Tank 1, and Tank 2. However, Tank 2 is also partly located at the aft fuselage that holds Tank 3, 4, 5, and 6, while Tank 6 is further divided into subsections, 6A and 6B. At full load, the tanks could carry a total of 46,254 liters, with a total weight of 36,414 kilograms. For the Blackbird, a special type of fuel was used, what they called Jet Propellant 7, a chemical mixture mainly composed of hydrocarbons. This special fuel was a colorless liquid with similar odor as kerosene. It had a melting point of minus 30 degrees Celsius and boiling point at 1 atm varying from 182 to 288 degrees Celsius. As I mentioned before, the high temperatures to which the plane had to withstand was also reflected in fuel technology. JP-7 had an auto-ignition point of 241 degrees Celsius, and if you recall, the plane temperature at Mach 3.2 was way above that. This is where the cooling system comes in. The fuel was used to cool itself and other parts of the plane. However, to achieve that, it was necessary to use air from the engines in a series of heat sinks to cool it down to 100 degrees Celsius and below. Further cooling was done by the air conditioning system located behind the RSO. Moving fuel around on any airplane usually affects its center of gravity. It had to be carefully managed for that specific reason, to maintain the Blackbird's center of gravity. For that, a series of powerful pumps worked together that could pump fuel as needed, ranging from 10.4 to 29 kilograms per minute, which was the standard automatic rate, and if necessary, the transfer rate could be dramatically increased to 105.8 kilograms per minute. The left engine was supplied by tanks 1, 2, 3, and 4, and right engine was supplied by 1, 4, 5, and 6. If any problem occurred, a cross-feed valve could be opened to allow fuel to go to both engines. They could sustain Mach 3.2 for a little over 90 minutes. All of this was designed to feed its hungry engines the first of its kind that could remain in afterburner mode for extended periods of time. A piece of technology so demanding that the entire airplane was designed for the engines that powered it. The Pratt & Whitney J58. A marvel to behold. Alright folks, to be continued in part 2. <laughs>